Um, before I properly start, I have a small disclaimer. Uh, I started working on this project three years ago as a sideline towards the end of my BA, but I had some rough patches both due to COVID-19 and other health-related issues, and there were many points when I felt I should be much further along the way and didn't manage to keep up with my research plans. And that feeling somewhat naturally um, extends until today what I want to present this project to you. Um, and I'm not sure if this is a universal experience among academics, but I thought it's important to mention at least um, some of the challenges uh, while I, uh, some of the challenges I faced while I say hi. Uh, I'm Amandas. I'm currently studying um, social theory uh, in a master's program in Jena in Germany, and I'm happy to record this presentation for you. And I hope it won't be boring. Um, despite the things I've just mentioned, I've had great luck uh, not only learning about ego early during my research, but also meeting Frank Hackemuller and Monique Goibas. From my point of view, it's pretty safe to say that this project, this study, would not have existed without both of their continued support, both in form of motivational Zoom talks and emails and practical advice on statistical analyses. So I'd really like to, th uh, to thank both of you, Frank and Monique, very much for this. And I'd also like to say thanks to Wojciech, whom you'll get to know in a minute if you don't know him yet, for advising me on questions regarding the design of the study and the questionnaire during the pretest phase in 2022. So what is it that I actually want to talk about? I want to talk about the impact of uh, narrative representations of pets and farm animals on reader attitudes towards non-human animals. Um, it's incredibly uplifting to see that several researchers from different countries all over the world are investigating the relation between literature and the socio-political challenges of climate change, especially empirically, which is, I think, quite a recent phenomenon. Specifically, I'm thinking of the 2020 article on environmental literature as persuasion by Matthew schneider Mayerson and his colleagues. They conducted a study where um, they confirmed the hypothesis that climate change fiction can have an impact on attitudes and beliefs towards climate change. And just now in August, an edited volume on empirical ecocriticism has been published, containing more experimental evidence on the impact of literature on readers with this specific focus, though I have to admit I haven't had the time to take a proper look at it. Um, thinking, both, thinking about both the environmental impact and the ethical implications of humans' way of treating non-human animals, the question, what about the other animals, seems to me of great importance to the field of empirical ecocriticism. And while we're at it, a word on the term animals. Uh, since I believe the widely acknowledged and entrenched dichotomy between humans on the one hand and animals uh, on the other hand is part and parcel of these challenges I just mentioned, I will go ahead and stick to the alternative label of non-human animals, which might seem cumbersome at first, but I think we'll manage. So what happened that led to this research project? I visited an effective altruism seminar at the beginning of 2020, and I took part in a workshop on uh, effective animal advocacy. And I began, began to wonder what people with my specific interest and expertise may contribute to the EAA movement. And I began to review research in this area and quickly got the impression, wow, not a lot of people seem to think about or work on literature and uh, non-human animals and uh, in, in combination empirically or experimentally. Um, literary animal studies or human animal studies are already big and established fields in and outside of literary studies, but the vast majority of uh, research in these fields seemed to me, at least at the time, deeply rooted in, uh, traditional, human in traditional humanities methods. Um, what I did find doing my research was the quite singular work of Wojciech Mawiecki and his colleagues in Poland, who had recently, relatively recently, studied exactly what I was interested in and even published this great monograph on it in 2019, uh, Human Minds and Animal Stories. So they conducted a whole series of studies investigating if and to what extent non-human animal uh, depictions in literary texts may impact readers' attitudes towards non-human animals. They took into account a diverse range of possible mediating factors such as uh, fictional or non-fictional texts, normativity in the text, first or third person perspective, uh, non-human animal species, and cruelty towards non-human animals, and they also conducted one study on the duration of the effect. While Wojciech and his colleagues were able to confirm uh, their hypothesis that NHA stories, uh, non-human animal story, that non-human animal stories can indeed influence attitudes towards non-human animals in several of those experiments, the book also felt to me like an invitation to delve into this research field 
partly out of interest whether it would be possible for me to replicate their findings in a different cultural context in Germany, and partly because some of their results were ambivalent and some questions remained unanswered. So I started out designing the study with two main hypotheses. The first one followed Wojciech's design and uh, Wojciech and his colleagues' design and results and was supposed to replicate them, as I just said. When people read a story about an, uh, a non-human animal being abused and killed, they will show more pro-non-human animal welfare attitudes than people who read a story that involves non-non-human animals. That was the, the hypothesis. Um, to survey attitudes towards non-human animals, I used the 10-item short uh, form of the Animal Attitude Scale, AAS, which was developed and first published by Harold Herzog, Nancy Bettert, Nancy Bettert and Robert Pittman in 1991. And in case you're wondering, I decided to use stimulus material where a non-human animal is abused and killed because Wojciech and his colleagues showed in one study that the degree of cruelty towards a non-human animal may actually differentiate the text's influence on attitudes towards non-human animals, um, so that the more cruel, the bigger actually the influence. And the second hypothesis uh, was partly based on my earlier research on non-human animal ethics and its implementation in literary texts. Specifically, I was interested in the arbitrary categorical distinction of different non-human animal species that has been criticized as speciesist as speciesists by scholars and activists such as Melanie Joy and Peter Singer. I wanted to find out whether the change in attitudes towards non-human animals that literary text may provoke actually differed depending on the non-human animal species the text confronts the reader with. Uh, Wojciech and his colleagues did also have a study where they showed that it plays a significant role how close a reader perceives the depicted non-human animal to be to humans. However, I thought it would be a good idea to look at the distinction between pet and farm animal specifically because of just how pervasive and powerful this dichotomization is in terms of predicting how people think non-human animals should be treated. Because pets should be treated way differently right, than, non, uh, than farm animals and because it does not correlate in any way with perceived or actual evolutionary closeness of non-human animals to human. So I decided on my second hypothesis. Uh, people who read a story about a typical pet being abused and killed will show more pro-non-human animal welfare attitudes than people who read a story about a typical farm animal being abused and killed. Um, now, I also had a number of additional hypotheses, which uh, partly aimed at the effect of expectable intervening variables such as gender, pet ownership, diet or lifestyle, and political views. Um, for example, uh, females, pet owners, vegetarians, and vegans usually have better non-human animal attitudes, etc., etc. There are some examples on the slide. I'm, I'm not going to read all of them. Um, but I also had hypotheses which included other potential confounders, such as uh, transportation, the perception of the respective non-human animal as a pet or farm animal, the reader's perception of war and hunger in today's world, because these were part of all the stories that I used, and more demographic variables such as place of residence, educational background, income, as well as reading habits. Um, I won't be able to talk about all of these in detail, obviously, but if you have any questions or ideas regarding those or any other aspect of the study, I'd be thrilled if we could have a chat in Monopoly. In Monopoly. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit, a little bit about my method. Um, I, can study, I conducted the study online with German native speakers using the platform SOSI Survey, and participants were randomly assigned to one of uh, three groups. So the first one was a control group that uh, read a literary text without any relation to non-human animals. The second group was the experimental group A, and the third group was the experimental group B. The stimulus for experimental group A was a relatively unknown short story by the German author Luise Rinzer named uh, Die Rote Katze, uh, so the red cat. It is about a family with very scarce food resources set directly after World War II. One day, a cat turns up and they start sharing their food with it, uh, which is very frustrating for one uh, for the son, who is the first person narrator. This builds up to the point where, from the narrator's point of view, the cat is uh, as fat as a pigling while the family is actually starving. He considers slaughtering it for its meat, which is rejected as very gruesome by the other family members. In the end, he kills it quite brutally without using or eating its meat, so actually wasting it, if you will. For experimental group B, this text was manipulated so uh, that the same happens, but with a chicken instead of a cat. 
And the control group actually read a different text by Luise Rinser, which is called Die kleine Frau Mabel, uh, which was similar to the experimental story in its style and general setting and themes. So it was also set after World War II, and hunger was also one of the most important uh, themes. Uh, but it didn't feature non-human animals in any way. It was only slightly edited to have the same length as the experimental story. Uh, after reading the text, participants were asked to answer simple questions about the text's con content to control for comprehension and exclude the possibility of bot responses and the like. And all participants then filled in the same questionnaire that consisted of items regarding both transportation and reader's worldview, which also acted as fillers to make the 10 item uh, animal attitude scale a bit less suspicious. In the end, demographic variables were collected and participants were asked to indicate whether they liked the text, if they found the questionnaire exhausting, and if they had any ideas as to the purpose of the study, um, because all of these were also suspected confounders that are controlled in the analysis. Um, the study was advertised mainly via social networks, email distribution lists, and in bookshops in different uh, cities. And the target population were people who like to read, at least occasionally, or have a general interest in literature. I presuppose what the existing literature suggests in this regard, uh, namely that people who do not meet these criteria will very likely not be influenced by reading in an experimental context. So there were 432 legitimate responses, uh, so participants who stopped responding before the last page were excluded entirely, and one of those 432 participants was removed during data analysis due to too many missing values. Uh, because of the nature of the advertisement and recruitment, especially by advertising the study via a book podcast on Instagram, the sample consists of 80.7% uh, females, so that's 348 out of uh, 431. Um, for reasons of time, I can only present a part of my findings to you now, but I hope to be able to tell you a bit more in Monopoly and to discuss with you then. So first, my main hypotheses. Uh, just a quick info, the color coding of the different groups should be the same for all of the plots. Um, analysis of variants showed that there was no significant difference in non-human animal attitudes between the three groups, so the control group uh, versus the experimental group A versus the experimental group B. You can see the means and the standard deviation on the slides. Um, now, for a while I thought uh, this result didn't change. Uh, Sorry. Now, for a while, I thought this result uh, didn't change at all when I took confounders into account by partializing the data according to gender, pet ownership, lifestyle, opinion about the text, or what I call the purpose flag. Uh, so whether or not people correctly guess the purpose or aim of the study, because I uh, suspected social desirability effects where people, uh, when they knew that the story was about animals, would actually respond uh, differently. However, at some point, I realized that a combination of confounders seemed to have had a much more pervasive effect than I expected. So I created a subset, uh, which you can see here, I created a subset of only those people who indicated that they were eating meat, so practicing an omnivore diet, and that they had no pets. And I furthermore excluded from that subset three outliers with the highest scores on the right-wing authoritarianism scale, which I also surveyed in the worldview section of the questionnaire, among other scales. The right-wing authoritarianism scale contains items such as we should be thankful for leaders or masterminds in German führende Köpfe who can tell us exactly what we should do and how, or it would be better for our country if young people considered values and traditions more, or the times in which strict discipline and obedience belong to the most important virtues should be over. That one reverse got, obviously. Um, and taking this into account, selective exclusion seemed reasonable to me for a couple of reasons. So the first one, uh, the right-wing authoritarianism attitudes have been shown to correlate with non-human animal attitudes uh, in several studies, and also in my study, actually. And it is unlikely that non-human animal attitudes um, by people with, uh, or, or those attitudes of people with deeply entrenched authoritarianism attitudes will change as quickly as those of other people. And the maximum of uh, the maximum value for the RWA score is actually 42. So uh, a value of 35 or something is is already quite quite high, quite conservative. Um, so you can see the plots here on the on the slide. Uh, you can see the the outliers, and um, you can also see that uh, analysis with this subset actually showed a significant difference between the control group and the one experimental group uh, with the hen. So if you remember my hypotheses, um, the one was partly confirmed, the other one not confirmed. 
by this result. Um, so the first one was that the, there's a difference between the story that featured a non-human animal and the one that didn't. And that one was confirmed if I just look at the control group and the experimental group for the hen, and the, yeah, the, the hen group. And um, the second hypothesis was that there's a difference uh, between the stories with a representative of the category of pet and the category of farm animal, respectively. And that one was not confirmed because there was no significant difference between the cat and the hen group. Um, now, one possible explanation um, for the direction of this uh, of this uh, difference, um, because I expected actually the cat to have a um, or the cat group to to have higher animal attitudes than the hen group, is that. Um, most of the time, both while designing the study and analyzing the data, I tried to follow the results of Wojciech and his colleagues, specifically when it came to the cruelty towards non-human animals depicted in the story. And that's why I chose this specific story after all. Uh, now, during analysis, my partner Anna actually made me aware of a different aspect that I had somehow neglected, although Wojciech had also investigated it, and it's the basis of many literary texts that feature non-human animals. So perhaps the crucial point, at least in my data, is not uh, abuse, but the connection that is established between the characters in the story and the non-human animal. So the empathy that readers may feel towards non-human animals. Um, the story shows that basic needs of humans and non-human animals aren't all that different. So both need food and shelter, for instance. And especially for people in this subset, so omnivores uh, without pets, it is perhaps more normal conceptually for a cat to have those needs, those, those basic needs met than for a hen, which they might perceive in a much more abstract way, for example, as a food resource. So this specific outcome of non-human animal attitudes in the two experimental groups, which contradicts my uh, hypothesis too, may be caused by some kind of special aha effect happening in the case of the hen, which is not as strong in the case of the hat. So um, the aha would be that farm animals also have basic needs. So that means the story might have actually made participants in the subset somewhat more mindful of farm animals, or at least one specific species of those farm animals, directly after reading, compared to the control group, which had significantly lower non-human animal attitudes. Um, now to my additional hypotheses, and all of these all of these analyses were done with the whole sample of 431 participants. Um, one hypothesis was that what I called a literary uh, non-human animal attitude alteration would be greater among people who experienced high transportation than among those with low transportation. So that would mean the higher the transportation score, the higher the difference between the control group and the experimental groups. Now, I wasn't able to confirm this hypothesis, probably partly because there was no difference between the control group and the experimental groups to begin with in this whole sample that I um, collected, but I found a co positive correlation between transportation and uh, the animal attitude score directly, but only in the control group. Um, so you can see it here in the, uh, in the plot, the orange uh, line is the control group. And uh, I have not yet come up with an explanation for this, so if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, and just as a side note, uh, I also found correlations between transportation and exhaustion uh, to the degree that uh, the more exhausted people were, the less transported they felt um, or the less immersed in the story and, um, and with uh, opinion. So the more people liked, a story, liked the story, uh, the more transported they also felt. Um, so, okay, I also had a set of additional hypotheses regarding non-human animals or species, so regarding the difference between the two experimental groups. Um, three of these hypotheses were confirmed. So the first one, people in group three were more confused why the animal was not slaughtered and eaten than people in group two. That is to say, the hen actually um, caused more confusion uh, as to not being slaughtered and eaten because um, that would be the obvious thing to do if there's food scarcity and uh, the whole family is kind of is almost starving. So the the item for that was uh, read. Uh, I was wondering why the family didn't uh, butcher and eat the cat or hen. Um, so that was um, so, so that was confirmed. You can see that on the left hand side here. Um, 
And the second one was uh, people who expressed less confusion showed better non-human animal attitudes. And you can see that on the right hand side. Uh, confusion, this expressed confusion negatively correlates with animal attitude, uh, with non-human animal attitudes. So uh, the people who were confused that you wouldn't butcher and eat an, an animal, any animal, a cat or a hen, had lower non-human animal attitudes. Um, right, uh, one more hypothesis ran. A people who read a story about a non-human animal being abused and killed will perceive the non-human animal differently on a scale from pet to farm animal than people who read a story without a non-human animal. And I asked people about whether they perceive a cat or a hen as a pet or farm animal uh, in a Likert type a question from 1 to 6. And I asked the experimental groups about the NHA, the non-human animal, their story featured. And to get a control response from the control group, I split them up randomly just for this one question. Half of the control group was asked about a cat and the other half uh, was asked about a hen. And now the plots show the, the opposite of my hypothesis, actually. Uh, the means and the standard deviations are almost identical in the control group and the experimental group for the cat responses on the one hand, so the orange and the blue um, box plot, and for the hen responses on the other hand, so the orange and the green uh, box plot. However, another hypothesis was partly confirmed. So people who considered the respective non-human animal more as a farm animal showed actually less pro-non-human animal attitudes. Um, and we can see that in the two plots here as well, the orange and the green regression lines. There is a significant correlation between the categorization and the animal attitude scale. In the case of people, I asked about a hen. Uh, from both uh, control group and experimental group, but not those I asked about the cat. And I guess that makes sense since the categorization of a cat for most people as a pet is not very questionable. And you can see that also uh, from the sizes uh, of the dots and the scatter plots, because the dots representing the cat are uh, very centered, I think. Um, what I wasn't able to find, again, was interaction between uh, categorization and condition, which I was also looking for. Um, However, once more, uh, the effect sizes of these correlations that I just mentioned are very different. So in the control group, which is the orange line in this plot, uh, again, the correlation between hen categorization and animal attitude scale uh, is almost twice as strong as in the experimental group, which is the green line. Um, so does it make sense to conclude that in the case of the hen, the treatment actually made the correlation between the categorization and non-human animal attitudes less strong? That would actually fit in with the main hypothesis explanation for the reduced subset, but I think I will have to think about it some more. Um, I also had a set of hypotheses on what I called uh, human problems. Uh, the idea was that influencing non-human animal attitudes with literature might not work if people are concerned with the plight of humans as opposed to that of non-human animals. Uh, because my experimental story was set after World War II, I tried to keep this variable constant by using a similar story as a control narrative. However, when I chose the story and prepared all the material, the Russian attack on Ukraine had not yet happened. So that obviously may have changed how people perceived the stories, perhaps even dramatically so. Um, but I wasn't able to change the entire design and stimulus material, so I included another Likert scale item that said, what prevails in today's world from your point of view, ranging from war to peace. And the hypothesis ran, people who think war outweighs peace in our world at the moment will be less susceptible to literary non-human animal alteration. So that would mean the difference between control group and experimental groups should be smaller in those subsets of people who think war outweighs peace. Now, I wasn't able to confirm this with the analyses I did, although I will need to take a closer look when I have more time and also more knowledge about regression. But I did find a correlation between the perception of war and peace and the animal attitude score directly in experimental group A, which you can also see here in the plot. Um, it's the, the blue line in the plot. And that correlation worked to the degree that people who thought there's more war in our world actually had better non-human animal attitudes. And uh, the same correlation for experimental group B actually approached significance, as you can see here on the slide. Um, with the aspect hunger, 
It was the same rationale as with the War Peace item. Uh, since both stories were focused on food scarcity, I wanted to see uh, whether how people saw hunger had an impact on the group differences. Again, I did not find evidence for that, but instead found a direct correlation, which you can see here on the slide, between the perception of hunger and animal attitude score in experimental group A and also in the control group, um, but not in experimental group B. Um, one more aspect was uh, empath empathy with the family from the experimental story, which I told you about in the beginning. Uh, the hypothesis ran, people who felt sympathy or compassion with the family because they had to witness war will have lower non-human animal attitudes, uh, in a sense because they are preoccupied with human problems. What I did find, however, was the opposite, but only for one of the groups, uh, which you can see here in the plot. So for the experimental group B, the hen group. Um, and I asked this question only in the experimental groups because I thought that I could not have a comparable equivalent in the control group because I read different stories. Um, but in retrospect, I think a control variable in the control group would have been helpful and also feasible to implement, although it obviously would have referred to the protagonist of the control narrative instead of the family. Now, lastly, I didn't want to withhold from you the correlations I found between several demographic variables and the animal attitude score. While uh, gender, pet ownership and diet were expectable in both their presence and their direction, I was surprised by the accuracy of the correlation between diet and animal attitude score, which you can see here in the plot uh, on the slide, and I did not expect uh, this result for education and income, both of which are negatively correlated with non-human animal attitudes. Now, place of residence too seems interesting to me since the uh, non-human animal protecting lifestyles, so vegetarianism, veganism, that correlate so strongly with high non-human animal attitudes are usually much more prevalent and supported in urban environments. And I think, despite the social change of recent years, that vegetarians, or at least vegans, are still more often frowned upon in the countryside than in the city. An obvious explanation for this result may be the closer connection of people in rural areas to nature and non-human animals in general, perhaps although or even because they are seen as a food resource. Um, due to my very condensed work process in the last couple of weeks, I'm not sure I feel entitled to draw far-reaching conclusions uh, from my results. I'm sure that while I have answered some of the questions I set out with, I have unveiled a whole set of new ones. However, despite the ambiguities I found during the analysis, uh, it seems as though, with some more time and focus, these results could actually contribute to our overall understanding of the impact of literature, non-human animal representations, on reader attitudes towards non-human animals. Uh, I'm afraid it was already quite a dense presentation, and also longer than I expected. I'm really sorry about that. Um, but I hope you got an impression of this project I've been working on, and I also hope you have questions. Since I didn't manage to fit it into the time limit of the presentation here, I will have to subsequently deliver further discussion of the results at the conference. Now, thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm very much looking forward to meeting you in Monopoly.